More than 5,000 years ago, a man was working by the Nile River, near the water's edge. Squatting in a dirty white kilt, he dug his hands deep into the mud of the riverbank. He scooped out handfuls of clay and dropped them into a basket with a wet slap. When the basket was full, the man hoisted it onto his head and made his way back up the riverbank. He headed for home and the next phase of his work. The man's home was simple, a mud brick construction shaped in a wonky rectangle. Its roof was made of animal skins. It was a modest but comfortable place to live, also a place to work. A few meters away from this man's house, he had set up a workstation. It was a low mound of earth, a platform with small pits made to hold the pieces which this man crafted. The man was a potter, and on this simple mound, he turned the clay of the Nile into high-quality pots and vases. It was a good job, and from this little place of work, the man fashioned a lasting legacy in clay. He also did something quite stupid. One day, the man was working on his pottery kiln. He prepared the vessel, then placed it in one of the pits, and set a small fire. The vase would bake, and the clay would harden. Soon, a pot would be ready for use. Well, not this time. As the man's pottery was baking, the wind shifted, and the embers from the fire blew out of the mound and over to the man's house. So close together, the mound and the house were within easy reach, and the flickers of fire hit his home. You can guess what happened next. The building, a simple wood and brick construction, caught fire. Soon it was in a blaze, and the house burned to the ground. What a bad day. In 1978, archaeologists working in the ancient city of Neken discovered the burned remains of this potter's house. The fire had been a disaster for him, but a blessing for us. In the great heat of the flames, the house's bricks had been baked hard and preserved. This allowed archaeologists to uncover the intact foundations and create a reconstruction of one of the oldest houses in Egypt. Through careful analysis of the materials, clay, wood, flora, and fauna, they could date the site, determine its history, and reconstruct how it used to look. Today, the potter's house is one of the great finds of Egypt's archaic history. As far as we can tell, the man and his family were not hurt by the fire. They probably packed up their remaining things, moved down the road, and started again. Their loss was our gain, and today we get a glimpse of some ordinary lives long, long ago. Hello everyone, welcome back to the History of Egypt podcast. Episode 2, Horus Takes Flight. In this episode, we explore the first dynasty of Egyptian rulers, the men and women that shaped the early state. We will also meet the first of the great gods, Horus, Lord of the Sky, the Eternal King of Egypt. Last time, we explored some of the legendary origins of the state. Today, we are firmly into the realm of history, and through archaeology, art, and written records, we can explore the lives of men and women who lived almost 5,000 years ago. The year was approximately 3000 BCE. Egypt, as we know it, was being created. Communities were coming together, and people were forming bonds far from their natural homes. All over the land, the people were in the process of building the world's first nation. They didn't know it, of course. The process happened gradually over many generations. But eventually, Egyptians could look back on their past and see that they were living in quite different times. This process could be summarized in one idea, the rise of kingship, monarchy, in the Nile Valley. 
Last time, we explored the semi-mythical foundations of the Egyptian kingdom. A man named Namer might have been the first ruler of the country, but his life and accomplishments sit somewhere between historical fact and mythologized stories. There is no certainty, and every generation of Egyptologists has discovered new material to expand and complicate the overall picture. I don't want to get bogged down in academic theories and proposals. It's fascinating stuff, but this early in our history, it's all a bit too much. I will say that these areas, the pre-dynastic and early dynastic periods, are perhaps the most dynamic and exciting area of Egyptian archaeology today. If you're a student looking for the action, the early phases are definitely the place to go. Anyway, let's brush past the articles and books and studies and begin on Egypt's first historical period, the first dynasty of its rulers. King Namer died around 3000 BCE. When he did, the throne may have passed to a man named Aha. We're not sure if Aha and Namer were related, or if there is a gap, but King Aha is the first historical figure to appear in our record, and he's the place that many modern studies begin their histories. Aha translates as warrior or fighter. His full name is Horus Aha, because his name is often written with the hieroglyphs of a large falcon, Horus, clutching a shield and mace, Aha or fighter. So his full name is Horus Acha, aka Horus who fights, or Horus the warrior. Horus Acha is our first genuinely historical king, a man whose deeds are not mythologized by art or stories. They simply appear in the archaeological and historical record as good, solid facts. From the artifacts themselves and texts written by later Egyptians, we can say quite a lot about Acha's reign. Aha was a successful leader by the standards of the ancient world. He was victorious in warfare, leading his warriors against tribes on the borders. Aha fought people in what is now Libya and the land of Nubia, Sudan, far to the south of his fledgling kingdom. Libyans and Nubians were ancient Egypt's favourite punching bags, good places to raid, take captives and plunder. For more than a thousand years, Egyptians would attack these regions almost with impunity. They were doing it from the earliest phase. We also know that Aha was a pious ruler, going on pilgrimages to the shrines of different gods. In particular, he visited a goddess called Neith. Neith, the warrior maiden, was a goddess of warfare, creation, and motherhood. She had a prominent and powerful cult in Egypt's northern lands, the wild regions where hunters pursued game and dangerous animals lurked. A goddess like Neith was a very good being to have on your side. We'll meet Neith later on. She's actually quite interesting. For now, let's keep our focus on Aha. King Aha had many accomplishments, but his greatest contribution to Egyptian history was the founding of a new capital city. This city in the north of the country would become the dominant city of Egypt for nearly 3,000 years, and it would be the primary seat of royal power for all of pharaonic history. That city is called Memphis. Memphis is a Greek word. The proper Egyptian name for this town is either Men Nefer, or Good Foundation, or Yinbu Heju, the White Walls. I'm going to call it Memphis because that's the most common form. But Aha would have known the city as Yinbu Heju, the white-walled city. It was called this, we assume, because the fortifications were covered in white plaster. This would have made the city a brilliant sight, shining in the sunlight on the banks of the Nile. As far as royal towns go, Yinbu Heju, or Memphis, is one of the greats. Memphis sits at the point where the Nile River turns into the Nile Delta. The river branches from one band of water to a dozen. North of Memphis, the vast greenery of the delta was a land of both immense potential and dark wilderness. It was home to many settlements, but very little unity, and for a good 500 years, Egyptians would work hard to turn the wild space of the north into something more manageable. We'll visit the delta properly in a future episode. 
We know that Aha probably founded the city of Memphis because his name is the earliest one to appear in the local archaeology. In Aha's reign, a number of tombs appear west of the city, belonging to the officials who served in the king's government. These men built ornate graves, not quite as ornate as the king's grave, of course, and in the oldest of these tombs, the name of Aha was carved in the ruins. So we assume that the men died during this king's reign, and since these are the oldest tombs of the area, we also assume that it was Aha who first moved the court to this region. Of course, that's just a hypothesis, but it's the best we have with the current evidence. You can see how much speculation goes on with this ancient period. We have a lot of material, but very few facts. And every few years, some new trinket or trace pops up in the record, and everyone has to reevaluate what they know of the first years of the kingdom. Surprisingly, we actually know more about Aha than many of the people who followed him. But still, it's all quite murky. Aha was a great king, as far as kings go. There are some questionable elements to his reign, which I will cover in the epilogue to this episode. But as far as the historical record is concerned, Aha was a great start to the royal lineage. Eventually, of course, Aha's reign came to an end. Aha died somewhere around 2980 BCE. He had ruled Egypt for about 20 years or so. When he died, he was buried in a large tomb at a town in the south. This town is called Abydos. The town of Abydos is the first great cemetery of Egypt's royalty. Long before the pyramids of Giza, it was Abydos that played host to the most important burials. Aha's tomb was simple, three square pits dug into the bedrock, and lined with bricks made of dried mud. In one chamber of his tomb, the king was laid to rest, along with some jewellery, pots, and maybe some weapons. Only a few traces of Aha's burial remain, mostly the pots, and we don't know that much about how the early kings were buried. Of course, compared to the fabulous treasures of later centuries, these early burials were quite modest, but it's all relative, right? By their standards, Aha's burial was very rich indeed. After Aha died, the throne passed through another two generations of rulers. These men, named Jer and Wadjet, were essentially more of the same. They led pilgrimages, raids, and oversaw agriculture. Basically, Aha's legacy continued, and the country prospered under a few decades of stable, reliable rule. There's not much to say about Jer or Wadjet, so I've chosen to omit them and move straight to the fourth ruler of this dynasty. Around 2930 BCE, the power of the throne passed on once more, and the fourth king of Egypt came to power. Wait, did I say king? Sorry, I meant queen. After the death of Wadjet, in a world first... A woman now took power in the kingdom of Egypt. She didn't call herself a Horus, so she's not quite a king in the traditional sense, but she was accorded full royal honours, including a great tomb among her predecessors. Her name is mer and she is the first ruling queen in history. mer or meret beloved of Neith, came to power around 2930 BCE. Records of this woman come from her tomb and from contemporary artefacts, which include her name as part of the lineage of rulers. Later on, she would be removed from that record, deleted by tradition-obsessed kings who couldn't stomach the interruption of a woman on the throne. But chauvinism aside, Merneith's legacy is fascinating. We suspect that Merneith came to power as the widow of King Wadjet. When he died, his son might have been too young to rule. So Merneith stepped into the power vacuum and handled affairs as her son's regent. That at least is the conventional interpretation, proposed by early 20th century Egyptologists, for whom the anomaly of a woman in the lineage was too strange to explain any other way than a widow acting as a regent. 
Without getting into the nitty gritty, I'll simply say that Merneith is a lot more mysterious than that would suggest. We know she was mother to the next king, but that doesn't automatically mean she was the wife of the previous. She could easily have been a daughter, taking power as the heir of King Wadjet. Now I'm just speculating there because the evidence doesn't go either way on this particular point. But I bring it up because Queen Merneith probably deserves a lot more recognition than early 20th century scholars were willing to give her. Merneith is best known for her royal tomb. This tomb was located at Abydos, alongside those of her predecessors. It was built in the same style, a large rectangular pit lined with mud bricks, and small chambers on the inside. The tomb was filled with grave goods, donated by Merneith's servants, along with provisions brought from her personal estates. Chances are that it was a very rich burial indeed. Merneith is also responsible for something quite fascinating. A large tomb near the capital city Memphis, which may once have been the grandest tomb of the day. In the old necropolis west of the city, there was once an enormous rectangular structure. This is called a mastaba, or bench, because it looks like a stone bench, and it sits not far from the legendary step pyramid of King Djoser. This mastaba tomb was built in the reign of Merneith. It might be the tomb of an official, or it might actually be her tomb. We simply don't know. The mastaba was long, 42 metres long, or 139 feet, and it was filled with chambers. There were about 20 rooms inside this building, and each one was filled with grave goods. Pots, furniture, stone vessels, food and drink. All the goods that a person would need for the afterlife. We're not sure who the owner of this mastaba tomb was. It could have been one of Merneith's officials, or it could actually possibly have been Merneith herself. Unfortunately, the scanty remains of a skeleton that were discovered in it have never been given the forensic testing, so we're just not sure. Either way, the existence of these monuments, her tomb at Abydos and her grand mastaba at Memphis, suggest that Queen Merneith was a wealthy, influential and successful ruler of Egypt. Although she was later removed from the royal record, it is quite clear that in her lifetime, Merneith was respected as a ruler and given the full honours of a monarch of the Nile Valley. With that in mind, we can possibly give Merneith the title of the first female ruler in history. If that's true, she beats the Sumerian queen Kubaba by a good 300 years. She is a remarkable milestone in early human history. When Merneith passed away, or stepped down, her son came to power for real. His name was Den, and he was perhaps the most successful ruler of the age. Even more than Aha or Namer, Den helped establish the Kingdom of Egypt as a truly effective state. Den ruled for nearly 50 years by some estimates, making him one of the longest lived kings in Egyptian history. Such a long life must have seemed like a blessing from the gods, their approval for just rule and effective leadership. Den does not disappoint in these regards. It seems that the king used his decades of rule quite effectively. He strengthened the government, enhanced the splendour of the crown, and may have led a raid into the area of modern Palestine and Israel. These kind of achievements made him a successful ruler by ancient standards, and Den is remembered fondly by Egyptologists. Den's most significant achievement was one tied to the bureaucracy. It seems that he was the first king to run a country-wide census, a grand counting of Egypt's wealth and prosperity. The ancient census was quite different from today, no computer databases or mail-in documents. Back then, it was done in person. The king and his entourage would sail up and down the Nile River, stopping at different towns throughout the land. The king, or his officials, would meet with local bigwigs and receive reports on the population and productivity of the region. They would count the people, the cattle, and assess the extent of the farmland, which gave them a picture of the overall wealth of the regions. 
From that, the king could set the upcoming tax burdens and carry on to the next town. Events like a census may not seem glamorous or exciting, but they are incredibly important. The development of government and regular measurements of wealth are an essential part in the creation of a state. To organize resources, you need to know what is available. To do that, you need to count it all up. For the Egyptians, 5,000 years ago, counting and recording were the most important tools to building their young kingdom. King Den ruled at an important phase in Egyptian history, and a lot of study has gone into how the early state developed in Egypt. Without getting into the weeds, we know that counting and writing were extremely important to that process. Fortunately, the Egyptians had a working tool for doing just that. They had hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphic writing, the symbols and pictures which make up the written language, are one of Egypt's most famous legacies, also one of its most misunderstood. Egyptian writing is not a picture language. A picture of a bird doesn't literally mean a bird, for example. Instead, the various symbols correspond to sounds like s or m or t and so forth. They combine to form words. Put a bird next to a feather and you might have the word emi meaning within or inside. Put a feather next to a squiggly line of water and you might have the word eni meaning to bring or to fetch. Some symbols will represent an idea. A flagpole, for instance, seems to denote a god or divine concept. A mace represents the idea for power or might. It's not hard to see where these connections come from. A mace gives you physical power over others, the power of violence. A flagpole probably held the banner or symbol of a god like Anubis or Horus. It's these kind of symbols that tricked early observers into thinking that hieroglyphs were a pictogram language, where every bird meant bird and every symbol reflected the object it depicted. Thanks to decades, even centuries, of scholarly work, Egyptologists now have a vast understanding of Egyptian grammar and written language. Back in the earliest days, the days of Aha, Mernith, and Den, writing was still in its infancy. They had a limited range of symbols, which included numbers, and these basic glyphs were the tools of early royal activity. Numbers were quite simple. A one was a vertical line, or a finger. Two was two lines, or two fingers. Three was three. You get the point. The Egyptians also understood grouping, and had different symbols for ten, one hundred, one thousand, ten thousand, etc. They counted all the way up into the millions, and this was probably very useful when they were doing those censuses, the grand countings of things that were in the kingdom. The reason I get into all of this is that it's important to understand how sophisticated the early Egyptian society really was. They weren't primitives by any stretch, and they were achieving great things with a small but versatile toolbox. Numbers and hieroglyphs were the foundation of the state, and by using them, the Egyptians would develop the skills needed to expand their power, run an economy, and build enormous monuments. All of this was underway from the earliest known kings. King Den ruled long, and when he died, he was buried in a magnificent tomb at the ancestral necropolis. He was a great figure in Egyptian history, and his reign might be considered the high watermark of the first dynasty. With King Den's death, we're going to pause our narrative for the rest of the episode. There were a few more kings in the first dynasty, but they are not particularly noteworthy, and we'll leave them alone for now. In the meantime, I want to start meeting some of the Egyptian gods. The tales of the great beings and the mythologies which surround them are at the heart of Egyptian history, and it's important to get to know the gods before we continue any further. I want to introduce the great god Horus, lord of the sky and ruler of the land, and also the great goddess Neith, who was an object of such veneration in the first dynasty. We'll meet the great gods after a short break.
Horus has arisen as ruler, life, prosperity and health. The Divine Council is in festivity, heaven is in joy. They have donned wreaths now that they have seen Horus, the son of Isis, arisen as the great ruler of Egypt. Their hearts are content, the entire land is in exaltation, now that they have seen Horus given the office of his father Osiris. End quote. Throughout the first dynasty of rulers, Egyptian kings referred to themselves by two names. The second name was their personal one, Aha, Jer, Wajet, etc. These names were unique and reflected each individual's image as a ruler. The first name was more universal, and it was shared by all the kings of this time. This name was Horus. Horus is one of Egypt's oldest gods, worshipped long before the kingdom was born, and probably since the very beginning of their cultural history. Horus is, first and foremost, a falcon, a bird of prey who soars overhead, riding the air currents in its search for victims. Such a threatening bird naturally became associated with two things, the sky and with kings. Horus is the royal god, the eternal king of Egypt. He is descended from previous gods and now rules for all eternity as the master of the earth. With outstretched wings and keen eye, Horus soars over the land and watches over his people. He is a ruler and a guardian, and he is known as Horus Neb Pet, Horus the Lord of the Sky. He was the greatest of the early Egyptian gods. The name Horus itself means one who is above, or one who is aloft. Pretty self-explanatory for the falcon. With such a command over the heavens, it wasn't long before Horus began to take on other attributes. As a lord of the sky, Horus also became associated with the sun. He appears in the first dynasty as a bird, riding in a boat across the sky. This is an idea that would later be used for the god Ra, but it first appears with Horus. Now you probably know that Horus is the son of Osiris and Isis, born after his father's death thanks to his mother's magic. That's true, later myths do recount the story in that general form. But the tale of Osiris and Isis is quite a late one. Back in the first dynasty, we don't have any evidence for those stories being popular. If they were being told around the campfire, no record has survived. So we're not sure when the myth came about exactly. Perhaps, as we'll see in episode 3, it emerged in the wake of upheavals which shook the kingdom just a little bit after the first dynasty. So Horus is the lord of the sky and the master of the sun. These traits made him a natural fit for the kingship, and pretty quickly Horus came to be associated completely with the idea of royalty. This played out very early in the royal symbols. As we saw at the start, King Aha is really better known as Horus Aha, Horus the fighter. Well, that Horus name would become enduring. After Aha, almost every king we will ever meet gave themselves a Horus name. King Tutankhamun, for instance, was the Horus Ka Nakt Tutmesut, Horus the strong bull, whose birth is pleasing to the god. Queen Hatshepsut was Horus Useret Kau, Horus the Great of Spirits. And Queen Cleopatra was the Horus Weret Nebet Neferu Aket Je, Horus the Great Lady, Thrice Perfect, Excellent in Council. The Horus name was a trend lasting almost 3,000 years, perhaps the longest running name in history. Well, it all begins here with Aha and the First Dynasty. Horus was the great god of kingship, but he wasn't alone. There was, as we've seen, a powerful female deity ruling at this time. Her name was Neith. The first queens of Egypt, wives and mothers of kings, often used a particular style of name. While their husbands were named Horus, the women were often named after the goddess Neith. We know, for example, about Neith Hotep, the wife of King Namir, and Merneith, the queen of the Nile. But there are also more forgotten figures, women like Herneith, Neith is above, and Naktneith, Neith is strong, who seem to crop up among the royal women. 
Now, not every queen or princess or wife had a Neath name, but a great many of them did. So, who is Neath, and why is she so important? Neath is one of the oldest gods in the land. Her cult emerged even before the kingdom, and it lasted for more than 3,000 years. So, she's a big deal, especially in the early period. Once upon a time, her faith was incredibly influential. Neath is, as I've said, a warrior. Her symbols were bows and arrows and shields. Her power was great for victory, and in some stories, she's also depicted as a wise counsellor, giving advice to the great gods. But, being a fighter and a mistress of wild lands, Neath also had a bit of a temper. Apparently, it was Neath who made the sky thunder, and could even make it collapse if she was angry enough. Neath was worshipped most often in the Nile Delta, the wild green lands which border the Mediterranean in the north of the country. Here, waterways and abundant foliage were perfect areas for game animals and birds to live. So the Delta was naturally full of hunters. Neath, skilled with her bow, was one of the very best deities to have on your side. Amid the waterways and greenery of the Delta, Neath was all-powerful. So Neith is a goddess mainly of the north, and she usually appears wearing the red crown of northern Egypt. Her power was focused in that area. Unlike other gods, Neith does not usually appear as an animal. Most of the time, she appears as a simple human woman. Usually, she will have a symbol above her head that looks a bit like a crab, but is actually two bows linked together. In this form, she could appear in the underworld with Osiris, or on the monuments of great kings. Neith, the powerful lady, was a strong figure indeed. As of 2018, Neith actually lives on in the realm of video games. The online action game Smite sees players take on the role of different gods and duke it out in brawls over the internet. As part of the grand pantheon of the game, The goddess Neith is one of the Egyptian figures. Neith appears as an archer. She sprints around the map, shooting enemies from afar. When leveled up, she can unleash incredible bursts of damage, like a divine sniper, able to destroy enemies rapidly. Neith is a lot of fun to play, and it's pretty cool to see this ancient figure revived for a new generation. So Horus and Neith are the two great gods of the First Dynasty. We're going to meet other gods as the story moves on. Different figures will enter as they become relevant. For now, it's time to wrap up this episode. The First Dynasty was a remarkable time in Egyptian history, a period in which political, cultural, and artistic development shines bright. It is a fledgling period, but from these early accomplishments, we can clearly see a people learning, growing, and experimenting with their world. Whether it was the unusual reign of Queen Merneith, the successful victories of Horus Aha, or the elaborate craftsmanship of tomb builders and craft workers, these most ancient Egyptians were performing some wonderful feats. We remember these early rulers and their people fondly. On the next episode, we'll wrap up the later kings of Dynasty 1 and explore the Dark Age of Dynasty 2. It seems that after a great start, Egypt briefly convulsed in a period of tension, and from this calamitous time, one of the most enduring legends of all would emerge. Join me soon for episode 3, Horus vs. Seth. Thanks for listening. As with episode 1, there is an epilogue to this episode, in which we explore a lesser known but grisly truth of the early kings. You see, in the cemeteries of the first rulers, we have surprising evidence for the idea that the early Egyptians practiced human sacrifice. For this morbid story, stick around after the ad break. The Citizens Bank student loan with multi-year approval keeps funding for your child's education predictable, but you still might get calls about things that are less predictable. Hey, Dad! 
How many cups of coffee are safe to drink the night after an all-nighter? I think I've had at least 10, but I lost count. <laughs> no matter what unpredictable things your child does during college, a low-rate student loan with multi-year approval means you could be covered from orientation to graduation. Learn more at citizensbank.com slash college loan. Terms and conditions apply. Not all applicants will qualify for multi-year approval. Citizens Bank is a brand name of Citizens Bank and a citizensbank.com slash college loan. There is an uncomfortable fact about the first Egyptian rulers. They, or their servants, almost certainly practiced human sacrifice. At the cemetery where these men and women constructed their tombs, the monuments of the earliest kings are surrounded by huge numbers of small individual graves. These subsidiary burials are all contemporary, and many of them are suspicious. Around the tomb of King Aha, there were 35 other graves. For King Jer, there were 318. Around that of Wadjet, there were 174, and around Merneith, another 40 plus were buried. The huge number of graves was arranged, apparently at the same time, in an orderly system of burials, and when it was complete, the king's tomb was surrounded by a barrier of his servants. These burials seem to be those of sacrificial victims. Now you'd be right for asking, hang on, a bunch of burials don't automatically equal murder. How do we know that these are sacrifices? Well, two things suggest it. Firstly, the burials are overwhelmingly men, both adult and youthful. This suggests, tentatively, that large numbers of servants or bodyguards or retainers were sacrificed, perhaps willingly, as part of the king's entourage. Having kept servants in life, the king would need these again in death. Perhaps these men and boys were sacrificed to perform that task. Secondly, the first excavator of these burials, Sir William Flinders Petrie, noted that many of the skeletons were lying in, quote, an oddly expressive posture, end quote. In other words, they weren't curled up in a fetal position or lying straight, like your ordinary burials. They were lying with arms and legs in different positions, almost as if they'd died while sleeping and their bodies had been shifting. Indeed, Petrie suggested that the victims had been poisoned and buried while comatose, so that they actually died with some consciousness. Yikes. It seems, as far as we can tell, that the first kings of Egypt went to the afterlife accompanied by huge numbers of servants. The practice didn't last very long, only a century or so, before it was very quickly phased out. But still, it's a curious mark on their legacy. Just to be clear, these are not sacrifices to the gods in the manner of the Aztecs or so. Rather, they are sacrifices meant to convey the soul of the victim to the afterlife, where they could continue to serve their master in eternity. This was essentially a continuation of the hierarchy and relationship that they had experienced in life. Serve the king, do as he wills, here on earth and in heaven. The sacrifices brought those servants along with the master to the afterlife, and in exchange for their earthly existence, the king gave them a place in the underworld. Whether these people went willingly or were forced, we may never know. But what is clear is that at the dawn of Egyptian royal history, the relationship between master and servant was a lot more complicated than we are used to. Then again, one might also describe these sacrifices in the manner of those who went into battle during World War I. The old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. Sweet and honourable it is to die for one's country.
The Citizens Bank student loan with multi-year approval keeps funding for your child's education predictable. But you still might get calls about things that are less predictable. Hey, Dad. How many cups of coffee are safe to drink the night after an all-nighter? I think I've had at least 10, but I lost count. <laughs> no matter what unpredictable things your child does during college, a low-rate student loan with multi-year approval means you could be covered from orientation to graduation. Learn more at citizensbank.com slash college loan. Terms and conditions apply. Not all applicants will qualify for multi-year approval. Citizens Bank is a brand name of Citizens Bank and a citizensbank.com slash college loan. 